It's December 1st. It's Advent season. We are starting a brand new series for the next four Sundays, the Sundays of Advent, to talk about Jesus, the Son. So here's what we're going to look at over these four Sundays. Today, if you want to take out that canary-colored page from your bulletin, we'll look at Jesus, the Son of Joseph. Next week, we'll look at Jesus, the Son of Mary. Then, the Son of Man, and on Christmas Sunday, how Jesus is the Son of God. And I'm actually very excited about all this. Very, very excited. So let's have a look here this morning at Jesus, the Son of Joseph, as we start. And we're going to look at Christmas from Joseph's perspective. He's a guy that I don't think we know a lot about. I, we all know his name, of course, Mary and Joseph, Mary and Joseph, Mary and Joseph. We heard it every Christmas. But what do we know really about this guy, Joseph? We've all grown up hearing that he was a carpenter, right? Carpenter. Reality is that the Greek word there means craftsman. So he could have been, and probably more likely, was a stone mason, a stone cutter. But he could have been a carpenter, so I don't want to you know, mess up your Christmas too much. He's a craftsman. He's this borrowed father for Jesus. And we want to see the story today from his perspective. Now, let's actually start in Matthew 13. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 13. We'll go back to chapter 1 later. And we read this. Jesus has been out. He's grown. He's been ministering. He's been healing people. He's been teaching. And now he comes back to his hometown, Nazareth. And he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were what? Are you following on? They were amazed. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Now, that would be enough right there, but notice the context. He is in his hometown. Wait a minute. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Ah, there's Joseph. Hey, isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? I mean, we know this guy. How can he be? What? Where did this guy get all these things? Imagine, right? Your hometown. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, <laughs> except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Wow, that's pretty amazing. They couldn't believe it. We know this guy. We know his father, Joseph, his mother. We know his brothers, his sisters. They're all right here. How could this guy that we grew up with, how could he have such wisdom and such power? Where did it come from? They couldn't believe it. Well, I want us to talk about Joseph this morning. And I, I want you to note that Joseph is Jesus' borrowed father, if you will, all right? And actually, there are a number of things throughout Jesus' life and ministry that were borrowed. When you think about it, here's Joseph, his borrowed father. When they get down to Bethlehem for his birth, after he's born, he's laid into a borrowed manger, right? And we assume that was in a borrowed stable because there's no room for them in the inn. We know that. Later, when he's ministering, one of his greatest miracles, he feeds thousands and thousands and thousands of people with what? Five borrowed little buns, loaves, and two borrowed fish. Later, when he comes into Jerusalem for the last time, and he knows it's the last time, it's, we call it Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. And how does he ride into Jerusalem to fulfill prophecy? On a borrowed donkey. Now, I want you to note that, too, as we go throughout the message here this morning, how many times what Jesus does fulfills prophecy, fulfills prophecy. I want you to note that. Now, here's why it's important. We know Jesus is who he says he is for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that he fulfills those prophecies. We'll see a whole bunch even just in his birth. Now, there are some skeptics. There are people who say, oh, yeah, maybe somebody just kind of, you know, made up this whole story and they wrote the prophecy and then they wrote that Jesus did it and wrote the prophecy. No, 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 no. Absolutely not true. Provably not true. Why archaeologists have found, you've heard of them, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these scrolls are of Isaiah and actually all the Old Testament books. And they talk and include these prophecies. And these were all clearly written before Jesus was born. Before Jesus was born, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. So we know they were there long before Jesus came and fulfilled them. And indeed, 
It's almost impossible for all of these prophecies, some super specific, to have been fulfilled in one person's life. So here's Jesus. And he rides, even as he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, it fulfills a prophecy from Zechariah hundreds of years before. Then that week when he dies on the cross, for you and me, he dies on the cross. They take him down from the cross, and where do they bury him? In a borrowed tomb that belonged to another guy named Joseph. Lots of, of very significant events in Jesus' life happened with borrowed things, and he even begins his life, and he is raised by a borrowed father. Joseph's not his physical father. That's the Holy Spirit, which we're going to read about here in a moment. No, he's is adopted, his borrowed father. Now, turn in your Bible back to Matthew 1, and let's look at the story, and let's read it together. If you've got your Bible, it's also over there in the notes on the Canary page. Let's read. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now let's stop right there for a moment, because some of you already have questions. I know because I've heard them. Wait a minute. They are only pledged to be married, so they're engaged. And yet later it talks about how he's a husband and she's a wife and how they are going to get divorced. Wait a minute, how can they get divorced if they're only engaged? you know, pledged to be married. I mean, why are they called husband and wife if they're only... I don't get it. You know, that's a good question. And we don't get it because it's not like here today. In our culture, there's kind of three steps, aren't there? Dating, and then you get engaged, and then you get married. Is that generally it? Or did you skip some of those steps? Some of you? No? Nope? That's generally it. That's not the way it was back in Jesus' day. Back in the first century, a Jewish wedding did have three steps, but they weren't the same. Now, it did start with an engagement, but the engagement wasn't between the prospective bride and groom. No, it started with the families, the parents. When those children were even very little, the parents would scout around, look around, and say, is there somebody else? You know, like, we're good, godly people. Is there another good family? And like, oh, we got a son, they got a daughter. Let's see if we can get them together, and those marriages were arranged often from very, very young. Those would be, and, and even contracts would be signed. You're not going to give your daughter to somebody else because we're set up with my son, and here that's going to happen, you know, when they get of age. Can you imagine that? Now, way back when my daughters were younger, I, I, I thought that was a really good idea, actually. Really good idea. I think her mother and I should pick out, you know, who they would marry. That'd be great. I'd be safe. Now, fortunately, today they're all married, and we are very happy that they've chosen wonderful, godly husbands. We're we're thrilled with two out of three. They're just (laughs) really... No, all of them. We're very happy. But back when they're little, it's like, "Uh uh-oh, who are they going to marry? What's going to happen? Well, in that day, and frankly, you're probably aware that in much of the world still today, it's the parents that arrange the marriage, right? And that's what happened. So that was the engagement period there. It was between the parents. And there was even often contract signed. Well, time comes. They're of age. They're ready to get married. And of course, you know, back in that day, that could have been as young as 14, right? Yikes. 14. They're ready to get married. Whatever age they were, 14, 16, 18, they're ready to go. And what would happen? That young man, he would go over to the home of his prospective bride. I mean, knowing that was going to happen anyway, but he would go and he would pay whatever the dowry was. You know, he would pay, you know, three goats, you know, whatever. And he would give it to her father and contract would be signed. Everything would be good to go. And with that signing, they were considered husband and wife. They were considered to be contractually obligated, right? married to each other. But this is called, folks, the betrothal period. It's the betrothal period because they were married in every way except they didn't live together. They didn't have, they didn't consummate that marriage. There was no sexual union at all. They didn't live together. This is the betrothal period. It could last up to a year. Now, when that guy had come to her house, you know, and and everything was good, and they signed all the papers, everything was ready to go, exchanged whatever needed to be exchanged. Now, listen to this. This is going to sound familiar. 
he would look at her before he left, and he would say, in my father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I wouldn't tell you. I'm going to go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me where I am. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Absolutely. Jesus borrows from this betrothal speech when he, the night before he goes to the cross, talks to his disciples. John 14, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, and this is where I love the old King James better, because it says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, the Greek word really, word really means rooms, but I'd rather have a mansion in heaven, wouldn't you? Who wants a room? Who wants a mansion? Okay, you're with me. All right. He would, Jesus, he's going to go to the cross. He's going to leave them. And so he says to them, don't worry. And they all would have, their ears would have perked up when they heard this. I know this. He's going to come back. We're, we're the bride of Christ. That's where it comes from. So the young man, Joseph, he would have left her with those words, you know, they're his, we're married, this is it. He would go back to prepare. Again, it could have taken up to a year. And then finally, of course, when that time is over and everything is ready, he'd come back. They would have the actual wedding ceremony, which would start the marriage. The wedding ceremony itself went for a week. I mean, that's why they were running out of wine in Luke chapter 2, and Jesus is at that wedding in Cana. It lasted a whole week, but then they're married. Now, this story of Mary and Joseph happens during this betrothal period. Joseph has been there. They're considered married, signed the papers, everything, but now he's preparing the place. It's in that time. Now, does that answer a question for anybody? How can they get, why do they get divorced if they're just engaged? They were betrothed. It was different. Now, I want us this morning to look at Joseph because his life is, well, we don't know much about it, but I think it's great. And let me share with you this morning, if you got your pen handy, five things that I really appreciate about Joseph. And here's number one. I really appreciate his relationship with God the Father. He is a godly man. As a matter of fact, here's what we read. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, literally, it says, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Well, how do you get righteous and right by being faithful to law, doing what God wants and obeying? So he's this righteous man. So he's got this dilemma. On the one hand, he's a righteous guy. He needs to do what God wants. You know, and that doesn't, if you're righteous, you don't mess around with sin. And now here is his, his betrothed wife, and she's pregnant. And it's not his. So he can't marry her. No way, he can't do that. And yet, yet he loves her. And so he doesn't want to see her disgraced. He doesn't want that to happen at all. He just can't bring himself to publicly disgrace her too. Now, what would have happened in those days? Well, we know in the Old Testament, if anybody was promiscuous, man or woman, you'd get dragged outside of the city and they'd be stoned to death. Well, Joseph didn't want that. Yikes. And in his day... That didn't happen as frequently, but they would be shunned. I mean, the whole town would shun this person. The, the whole town, even her own family, her own family would shun this person. And, and Joseph didn't want that either. So there was a, a third option. I mean, could, I could just quietly send her away. I mean, off to an aunt or somebody. And we do know that Mary went and visited her Aunt Elizabeth later. I'm just going to privately, quietly do this. You know something this reminds me of? I think those closest to us often cause us the most spiritual heartache. You ever had that? Some of you have that in your family? I truly believe the people closest to us most often test our relationship with God. I, I've personally seen situations where all of a sudden somebody in your family might be a brother, sister, might be one of your kids, and all of a sudden they decide, nope, I don't believe this anymore. Nope, that's different. No, this is who I am, or this is what's going on. And, and all of a sudden, you're challenged. Like, okay, here's what I believe the Bible says, but here's what they're doing. And, I, and I've got this choice. Am I going to go along with my family member, or am I going to go along with God? And I've seen way too many ditch God, ditch what the Bible teaches, ditch 
what they've always believed strongly just because a family member makes some big decision against God and his ways in the Bible, and then they're conflicted. You've seen it. I've seen it. I wish I had time to tell you some stories here because they're just, they're sad. They're sad. I will tell you one story because you know me. And I always do. My brother, Randy, is also a pastor. And there was a gal in his youth group, older, later, 18, 19. And, and uh, she came to him and she said, you know, I'm dating this guy. Oh, wonderful. You know, like, is he a Christian? No, he's not a Christian. Ooh, yikes, yikes, not good. He goes, yeah, yeah, but, you know, we're just dating. And they're saying, yeah, but why? What do you date? What's it going, you know, what does it lead to? So about a year later, she said to him, hey, we're engaged. You know, will you marry us? We're engaged. You and this same guy? Yeah. Oh, did he become a Christian? No, but I think he's getting closer. He said, you know what? The Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. Like, a Christian should not marry another Christian. Like, I can't marry you. What? This is my church. I grew up in this church. You know, I've always been a member of this church, you know? You have to marry me because I've it's my church. Yeah, but you wouldn't ask me to help you rob a bank by driving the getaway car. Don't ask me to marry you to a non-Christian. And this actually went all the way to the board in the church where this... This gal's grandmother was on the board and she had been a member of this church for like 80 years. And at one point she even said, never never would she have pictured saying this, can't we just set the Bible aside this one time? Wow, wow, wow. You know what? When your family gets involved, you be careful. You think now. And state now, I'm always going to follow God and his word. Amen? That was a little weak. I will always follow God and his word, even when it gets emotional, even when it's family, because I am a Christian committed to Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to hold you to that. When you come to me and say, can't we set the Bible aside? No! We'll never set the Bible aside here. Amen? Thank you. You're ready. I appreciate Joseph's relationship with God, number one. Number two, I really appreciate Joseph's attitude towards Mary. Now, you might be thinking already, ooh, so he's just going to ditch her? This is bad? This is wrong? No, no, no. He couldn't marry her. This was wrong. This is, it just wasn't the right thing to do because he was a righteous guy, and she obviously wasn't. Hmm. But look at what he says. Joseph did not want to expose her to public disgrace. Wonderful. No, instead he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Again, they were in this betrothal period. It meant a divorce. So he's pondering. Is he disappointed? Yes, they were going to get married. She was going to be his wife. My goodness, was he hurt? Well, yeah. How could this happen? Did he feel betrayed? Wow. I think maybe more than anything else, he was confused. Like, I know Mary. I know the kind of person she is. No way she would do this. This isn't in her character. How can this happen? Now, you know what? I think you and I, I think our normal human reaction would be to say, why did she do this to me? I mean, we had all our plans. I had committed myself to her. Like, how? Why did she do this to me? And you know what I think? I think your reaction to things shows who you really are and what kind of Christian you really are than all the other actions we take. See, when we, when we take action, we have a plan, we've thought it out, but when we're reacting to something that happens to us, that's when what's really inside comes out. Would you agree with that? I've got this in your notes. A person is known not by how he acts when he's in control, but how he reacts when things are out of his control. I think the pressure, how do you know what's in that grape? Squeeze it. See what comes out. Get a little pressure. See what really comes out. And here is Joseph, and this is tough. He wasn't planning on this, not at all. Now, again, our normal reaction, something like this happens, would be, why is this happening to me? I didn't ask for this. This is not fair, right? All this. 
I wonder how many of you here are old enough to remember the song, Why Is Everybody Always Picking On Me? Remember that song? It's a classic. It's a cla- Not a classic. Why is everybody always picking on me? All right, so I'm 90. Live with it. No, that's not Joseph. He's not saying, why me? Why is this happening to me? Who's he thinking about? Her. He's thinking about Mary. He doesn't want to see her stoned. He doesn't want to see her even shunned. He wants this to happen quietly, out of sight. Nobody knows. You see, because of his relationship with God, he says, I'm not able to marry her. And with his relationship with Mary, he says, I'm going to protect her and watch out for her. Now, ladies, wake your husbands. They need to hear this. This is an important point. Wake them up. Ready? You can tell a lot about a husband. You can tell a lot about a man by the way he treats his wife. What? That was profound. I didn't hear any amens. I didn't hear any cheers. Nobody waved a hanky or anything. Nobody said hallelujah. God. Ladies, I just, spiritual deadness. What? What's, okay, what? Okay, watch this. Men, men, you can tell a lot about a woman by the way she treats her husband. There you go. See, we have a lot of church of godly spiritual men around here. You, Proof, right there, right there. All right. And the ladies are going, who, him? Yeah. All right, seriously now. Don't you appreciate the way Joseph treated Mary? For that day, for that culture, it was pretty amazing. And I love that. Number three, here's a third thing I appreciate about Joseph. I appreciate his sensitivity to God. His sensitivity to God. Now, the next verse starts by saying, but after he had considered this. Oh, now, wait, just a little sentence. Why is that important? Because that tells us Joseph had a plan. All right? He knows what he's going to do. Not this is going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. Here's what we're going to do. He had considered this. He had a plan. But you know what happened? Just like in many of our lives, God came along and messed up his plan. You know what often works? Let's read. After he had considered this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. God's messenger said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit and she'll give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. Oh, that's amazing. Joseph's got a plan. He's considered it. He's talked about it. He's going to talk to her. They're going to have a plan. And God comes along, sends an angel, says, nope, I got a better idea. I got a better plan. Hey, folks, has God ever messed up your plans? You ever had a plan and like, this is what I'm going to do. Here's where I'm going. This is what... I, many of you have heard me tell this before, but I wasn't going to be a pastor That wasn't my plan. That wasn't my dream. I was never against it. My dad was a pastor, but that wasn't my plan at all. I I know you couldn't picture this, but I thought I would eventually be a history teacher. Him? No. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. God said, nope, nope, that's it. Change. And there's a whole bunch of other changes need to happen along with that too. And I'm amazed. It's great. But you know what? It's hard to be sensitive to God. Okay? Got your pen handy? Hard to be sensitive to God, number one, when you've made your own plans. I got my dreams. I know what I want. I know what I'm going. And what's the word keeps coming up? I, 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 right? And when you have everything set, it's hard to be sensitive to what God says because he might say something different. It's hard to be sensitive to God when you're emotionally involved with the problem. We already talked about that. People will ditch their faith when they're emotionally involved and, and there's a conflict there. Joseph loved her. I mean, she was going to be his wife. That makes it hard. It's hard to be sensitive to God when risk is involved. Now, make no mistake, for Joseph to take Mary as his wife, there, was, there were huge risks involved. I mean, did he really believe her? This is God. <laughs> God did this? Would you believe your fiancé? Oh, it was a miracle. Would you believe Parents, would you believe your daughter? 
Hmm, yeah, yeah, God did this. I mean, seriously, think about it. Or how about that community or that culture where people were stoned if they were promiscuous? Hard to be sensitive to God when risk is involved. It's hard to be sensitive to God when God's plan doesn't make sense. I mean, how do you explain this even? I mean, imagine Joseph sitting down and explaining this to his parents. Mom, Dad, you're not going to believe it. (laughs) And I'm sure when he's done, you're right. We don't believe it. There's got to be another story. Come on. Be serious with us here. Now, if an angel, now think about it. If an angel would have told me this story in a dream, I would have awakened and thought back to, you know, what did I eat for supper last night? Giving me these crazy dreams. Yeah, my goodness. It's hard, hard when God's plan doesn't make sense for us to go ahead and do what he says. Maybe at your work, you're called to be a person of integrity. It's hard to be sensitive to God when others will not understand When other people won't understand, their parents, how would they understand? The whole community, how would people understand? It's so hard. You know what, friends? I think God had to pick a very righteous man for this job, don't you? I mean, somebody without the grace of God could not handle this assignment. Amen? I love that God does this. Are we sensitive to God? Hey, you know the uh, Peanuts cartoons with Charlie Brown and Snoopy? One day, Lucy and Marcy are on their way to school together. And Lucy looks at Marcy and she says, Today, I'm going to ask the teacher if I can be Mary in the Christmas program. And Marcy looks at her and says, Oh, she's already asked me to be Mary. Well, Lucy doesn't listen. And she says, I think I would make a wonderful Mary. I think I am the one she'll pick. And Marcy says, Yesterday... She asked me to be Mary. Well, Lucy says, it just seems appropriate that I would be Mary because I'm the one in the class that's most outstanding. And Lucy says, Marcy says, the teacher has already asked me to be Mary. And Lucy says, my favorite scene is where Gabriel comes to me and tells me that I'm going to bear the Christ child. And Marcy says, Lucy, Gabriel would never come to you. You don't listen. (laughs) I think we're all a little bit like Lucy sometimes, aren't we? I mean, we've got our plans. We got what we want and what we think. And boy, oh boy, it's very hard to be sensitive to God. I'm so glad Joseph was, aren't you? One more thing, a couple more things. Another thing I appreciate about Joseph is his obedience to God. His obedience to God. We're going to have some fun with this. I think this is great. Now, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Now, notice again, we've seen this, how so many parts of this Christmas story are fulfilling prophecy that we know definitively prophesied long before it happened. What was one of them? Well, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And look at Joseph's obedience. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. You know, there's not a lot about Joseph in the Bible. There's not a lot. There are four kind of parts, really, here in Matthew 1 and 2. And in each of these four parts, we see Joseph obeying God. Now, here's the first one we just saw. First time we see him is when he takes Mary to be his wife, okay? And we just read that. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home. But look at the first part. When Joseph woke up, he arose. When he got up, I mean, right away, he did what God wanted, what God had said. Right away. I love that. Here's the next one. Go to chapter 2 of Matthew. Joseph takes Mary and Joseph, Mary and Jesus, to Egypt. You remember the story, right? The wise men come from the east. By now, Mary and Joseph are in a house, and Jesus is called a child, not a baby. But they come, they bring the gold, the incense, and the myrrh. And then, as they leave, what does it say? When they had gone, the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, 
for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And what do we read? So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. By the way, if we went on in that passage, it would say this was to fulfill the prophecy that God had said, out of Egypt will I call my son. Come out of Egypt. Wait a minute, how can he be out of Bethlehem and out of Egypt and out of Nazareth? What? God knows. God can figure it all out. Here's the third one. Joseph returned to Israel with them in obedience to God. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, (laughs) every time, get up. Take the child and his mother. Go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he, what? Got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. He obeys every time, right away. Next day, I'm going to take a week and think about it. No. He gets up right away. One more. Joseph returned all the way to Nazareth in Galilee. Just didn't stop when he got to Israel. He kept going through two provinces to get to the third one, Galilee. Here's what we read. When he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Well, yeah, if Herod was trying to kill Jesus, maybe his son still is too. So having been, what? Warned in a dream, the fourth time God is talking to him in his dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene, someone from Nazareth. I love this. Joseph is obedient over and over. God speaks, he gets right up and gets on it. Wow. This obedience involved risk and separation and big changes in his life. I mean, he would have to leave his home. He would have to leave his job. He would have to leave his family. But he was obedient. And maybe another question for you and me this morning is this. Am I only obedient when it's easy? When it's safe? Am I only obedient when it's convenient or comfortable? I love that Joseph obeyed when it was none of those things. Would you agree? One more thing I appreciate about Joseph And it's his desire to glorify God. In his life, his number one desire was to glorify God. Now, here's the last verse of this passage. And it's very interesting. But Joseph did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Till after Jesus was born. And he gave him the name Jesus, which the angel has said. Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew. It means God our Savior. God saves. What a great name, of course, for Jesus, the Savior. He didn't consummate the marriage. So even though they're married, and now they're together, and God says, okay, you're married, he didn't have sex with her till after Jesus was born. He gave the child Jesus. Now, let me ask you, do you ever wonder why? I mean, why do you think Joseph had no union with Mary until after the birth of Jesus? Why do you think it was? I'll tell you why it was. He was so thrilled with what God was doing that he didn't want to interfere in any way with the hand of God. He didn't want to interfere in any way with God's plan. I mean, he wanted to be able to look his friends, his neighbors, his family in the eye and say to them, this was God, absolutely wasn't me. This was a miracle from God. I had no part in this at all. He wanted God to receive the glory. Amen? He didn't want to do anything that would mess this up. I love that. And frankly, I admire anyone who can discipline themselves so that whether with their body or their actions or their attitude in life, they only want to point to God and give him glory. Amen? I admire anybody who can discipline himself like Joseph did here to make sure God gets the glory and God gets the credit. Now, folks, you don't read much about Joseph in the Bible. Matter of fact, we've read it all. We've read it all here this morning. And actually, there's only just a little bit more written about Mary, which we're going to look at next week. 
and try to do that in a creative way next week too, Mary and Elizabeth. Joseph was, I want you to think about this. Joseph was a borrowed father for a short period of time. And here's Jesus growing up in Nazareth with his borrowed father modeling for him all the things that were important in life. Let me show you. Got your notes? What was Jesus being modeled by Joseph? What was he modeled? His relationship with God the Father. Should parents, grandparents, should we be modeling a relationship with God for our kids, grandkids? Yes? Yes? Uh, His attitude towards Mary. Men, particularly, should we be modeling a proper attitude towards our wives or toward women in general for our boys? Yes? What else was he modeling? A sensitivity to God, to listen to God, and then following up that to obey God and do what God wanted, even if it's hard and life-changing. Do we model that? And then a desire to glorify God with his life as well. Should we be modeling that? Of course. Now, can we, can we look back and see if it worked? Did Jesus have a right relationship with the Father? Oh, yeah. He, he would take time and pull himself away from the crowds. He would stay up all night in prayer or get up early. He would spend that time with God in communion with God. Did Jesus have a right view of women? Absolutely. Absolutely. He honored his own mother. And later on, when he's in his ministry, he, like he, he going through Samaria, the hated Samaritans, and not only does he stop at the well to talk to a Samaritan, but it's a Samaritan woman. This is like a hundred things you don't do. And he did them because he honored women. And even later, when he rises from the grave on Resurrection Sunday, who are the first people he reveals himself alive to? Women. Jesus had an amazing relationship, amazing view, respect for women. It was modeled by Joseph. Now, how about hearing and sensitivity to God? You know, when the crowds were wanting to crown him as their king, no, he knew what he was there for, and it was to take a crown of thorns, and he let them go. Obedience, that week he goes to the cross and and the night before he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And he obeys by going to the cross. And when he goes to the cross, what is his number one goal? That we would be saved and that all the glory would go to the Father. Philippians 2, to the glory of God the Father, Jesus humbled himself was obedient to death, even death on the cross. The glory of God. Wow. And I don't know, maybe like me, you never thought of this before, but Joseph modeled all those things for Jesus. And now, you and I are called to model all these things before our children, before our grandchildren, maybe before those nieces and nephews, or certainly in front of those co-workers, family members? Are we up to it? We have the power of God. If we make the commitment, God will supply the power. I love Joseph. He's great. Didn't realize there was what a great guy he was. But aren't you thankful for the example to Jesus and today to us? Amen? Father God, thank you so much for this story of Joseph. And today there's a lot for us in this story. There's a lot. Some of us are husbands today, and we need to love our wives as Christ loved the church, as Jesus saw it in Joseph. We need to have that right view of the women in our lives. And some of us here are fathers And here's Joseph, though he was just a borrowed father, he loved Jesus and poured himself into him. He walked the talk. And Lord, that should be us too. And for all of us this morning, we are all ambassadors for Jesus. We are all models of what a Christian is like to anybody around us. Help us, Father, to be sensitive, listening for your spirit. 
and then obedient no matter what the cost and all of our lives bringing glory to you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.